Good morning to you all or good afternoon or evening to the many of you who are joining us today from outside of the US. My name is Deirdre White and I'm the CEO of Pixera Global and I'm very pleased to welcome you to this first webinar in our Rhetoric to Action series. Let me start with a quick snapshot of what we'll cover today, uh, a brief intro from me and then I'll hand over to Renee Loper and Marcus Allen to hear their observations on developments in the private sector. We'll talk about next steps and take your questions, and then I will very briefly wrap us for the day. So with that, <clears throat> I wanna to start today by just sharing a word about Pixera Global for those who don't already know us well, and to give some context for why we elected to convene this rhetoric to action series. Pixera Global has worked for the last 30 years driving public-private social sector partnerships to address complex social challenges. We know that a well-designed and managed cross-sector partnership is the only road to true systems change. And we work with a number of you for participating today on your efforts to engage your employees in social impact through our global pro bono work. We work with others of you to affect positive change in your communities and supply chains through our enterprise and community development work. And we work with many of you to co-create long-term strategies for how to implement your ESG, shared value, corporate citizenship, or other social justice related goals. Now, like so many back in June, we at Pixera Global as an organization began a process of contemplating our own role in perpetuating structural racism. And we committed ourselves to change. For us, there was a real moment of recognize, reckoning when we realized that even as an organization dedicated to positive social change around the globe, we were so often treating the symptoms of structural racism and rarely, if ever, taking on the disease, the pandemic of racism itself. And we own that we have a lot of work to do internally and in our partnerships to be part of the solution, not part of the problem. We opened up a series of company-wide, open, honest, important, painful, and helpful conversations, and we took several immediate actions. A group of staff representing a cross-section of our organization, and importantly, not our communications team, took the lead on spelling out our position and commitments in a public announcement in June. We promised at that time to make regular progress reports to our partners, colleagues, and peers. So permit me to begin some of our progress report here. In early June, we publicly committed to educating ourselves about race and racism, having uncomfortable conversations with friends, family, clients, and partners about structural racism, providing time to staff to meaningfully and actively engage in the work that gets at the roots of structural racism, and developing direct programming that addresses structural racism. And I'm pleased to say we've made some, but not near enough, progress on each of these points. Here's where we are today on each one of our commitments. We created an internal working group called the Anti-Racist Collective, ARC of Change. This group meets bi-weekly to help keep us accountable on our commitments. We've also created an anti-racist education resource exchange, which will become a cultivated resource library in the near future. We began bi-weekly open staff conversations, which we've entitled Courage Over Comfort, where we provide a backdrop for hard discussions on topics such as white privilege and the binary code of racism. We have had open and tough conversations with clients and partners, pushing them to assess the purpose, intentions, and motivations of their social justice program. As of Juneteenth this year, we moved to a four-day work week. And we have highly encouraged staff to use some of their found time to educate themselves and their families to volunteer for racial justice causes, to write about the topic for personal or public use, or to brainstorm or design effective programming that Pixera Global should be taking on in the racial justice space. And we've even begun some direct programming, just begun. And I'll share three quick exciting developments with you. First of all, the Reimagining New York City's Economy Challenge will kick off next month, looking at how to rebuild New York as a hub of circular economy and inclusive business opportunity. We still do have some opportunities for corporate partners on this program, so please do reach out to us to learn more. I'm also delighted to share that MasterCard, whom we've been working with for over a year, 
uh, to develop a, an inclusive growth global pro bono program. Um, while they've had to put that program on hold due to COVID-19, MasterCard sees this program as a blueprint for work they can now do to dismantle structural racism. Building on the MasterCard mantra of doing well by doing good, our design has shifted to how this mantra applies to Black communities specifically. And with a new nine-week virtual pro bono for racial justice program beginning in October, this is just one way that MasterCard will stand by its recent commitment to take action against racism. Their commitment also includes growing Black leadership by 50% at the VP level, creating more inclusive-minded leaders, and challenging employees to work in service of the Black community while also recognizing their own privilege and biases. And all of these elements of their commitment will be woven through this virtual pro bono program that's kicking off next month. I'm also happy to share that SAP, as part of its larger commitment to support social justice efforts in the US, has committed to developing an additional portfolio of pro, pro bono programming that will focus on advancing economic equity in Black communities by supporting Black-owned businesses. The portfolio will include a combination of virtual and in-person pro bono engagements and will target communities in major US cities, such as Atlanta, Philadelphia, New York, and Chicago. Through the various stages of design and implementation, SAP and Pixera Global will incorporate an assessment of existing systems that place Black-owned businesses at a disadvantage in relation to their non-Black counterparts. These engagements will allow SAP employees and their business partners to build a better understanding of how the present system operates and what role corporations can play in addressing social justice while simultaneously building the capacity of these businesses to confront challenges the system presents. So that's just a little bit about what we've done so far. But as I said earlier, it's not enough, not nearly enough. So now I'd like to hand it over to Renee Loper, Pixera Global's VP for Program Innovation, and Marcus Allen, CEO of Independence Big Brothers Big Sisters, and just a brilliant and creative thinker on how we can all be bolder and do more to dismantle structural racism. Renee, Marcus, I'll hand it off to you. Excellent. Thank you, Deirdre. I am ecstatic to have this conversation alongside Marcus, um, as Deirdre mentioned, CEO of Independence Region of Big Brothers Big Sister. Um, not only is he the CEO, but Marcus also sits on the Pennsylvania State Advisory Committee to the U.S. Commission on Civil Rights um, and a variety of boards, including the Advisory Board for the Philadelphia Mayor's Office of Community Empowerment and Opportunity, as well as the boards of the United Way of Greater Philadelphia and Southern New Jersey and the Philadelphia Association of Community. Um, so needless to say, Marcus is often a sought after speaker to speak about issues affecting the black community, um, specifically around mass incarceration, poverty, homelessness, and the list goes on. Um, so Marcus is indeed a trusted community leader and advisor to many leaders and executives at corporations, uh, some of which are with us on the call today. And so it's for these reasons, along with a whole host of others, um, including the fact that Marcus, you're just truly an inspirational, uh, thought-provoking human. Um, so excited to have, have this space with you today. So excited that all of you all can join us as well. So let's dive in. It is no secret that we are in some unprecedented times. Um, and in that, I acknowledge that issues of race and conversations around how to end racism are not new. Uh, in fact, they've been happening for centuries and generations. Um, what is unprecedented though, is that this is a unique moment in time where globally, there are collective demands for action and change, um, and specifically towards ending structural racism. What else is unprecedented though, is that businesses are speaking up and acknowledging these issues publicly. Um, that's huge, uh, that's new, and that's unknown, that's unknown territory for many of us. So before Marcus and I dive into what we're seeing and what can be done toward dismantling structural racism, I wanna contextualize a bit. This is such a dynamic, complex, multifaceted topic that is impossible to unpack in one hour. So we're not going to try to do that. Um, and there's so much that we're not gonna be able to get to. Uh, we won't be speaking about the personal, interpersonal aspects of dismantling structural racism, you know, such as personal reflections and education and things of that nature. 
Um, nor will we be able to talk about internal organizational aspects, such as courageous conversations, employee resource groups, diversity and inclusion task forces, and policies, and the list goes on, um, all of which are critical, all of which are important foundational elements that are indeed part of the system that must be addressed. Uh, we just won't be able to speak about that here. What we will speak about is from our perspectives, what corporations can do toward ending structural racism societally. Um, so what are the intersections between business and society when it comes to examining uh, structural racism? When we speak about structural racism, we're speaking about the form of racism that is embedded in normal practices within the society that lead to issues such as discrimination and criminal justice, housing, healthcare, political power, economics, education, and the list goes on. One thing I will caveat all of that by saying is um, when we speak about structures and systems, I think it's also important to highlight that uh, perpetuating racism and maintaining these structures is a very individual act. It comes down to individual attitudes, behaviors, actions, and so forth. I'll say that again for the folks in the back of the room, that perpetuating racism is an individual act. So many of you on the call know that one of the things we often speak about at Pixera Global is that it's individuals, it's people that bring about change, it's people that partner, it's people that collaborate or do anything for that matter. Not the governments, not corporations, not an entity, but the people that drive them. So I say that to say that it is indeed within our power as a collective of people to drive change societally within the organizations and through these organizations. So now that we got that clear, let's start to take a look at where we are today in terms of corporate response to the recent amplification of these issues of race. As you see here, there's been a lot of rhetoric. There's been a lot of talk around Black Lives Matter, around solidarity, standing with the Black community, commitments around what companies won't tolerate, um, and some on what they will do to demonstrate their intolerance uh, and their commitments to solidarity. There's been billions, with a B, billions of dollars committed toward organizations on the front lines, you know, whether that be legal defense funds and civil rights organizations. Uh, community investments, such as investing in historically black community, uh, excuse me, colleges and universities, uh, minority led businesses and, and nonprofits and that kind of thing. There have been workforce development, the list goes on. There's been a ton of commitments, a ton of dollars uh, put behind these commitments. If I'm being honest, something else that I've seen is a sudden surge in marketing and campaigns. I've seen a lot of businesses and brands uh, portray images that look to represent solidarity and it represent images that I only hope they're reinforcing with policies and actual action. But there's been a, a sharp rise um, in just the visibility around black faces and, and black and brown faces um, and what we represent. There's also been a sharp visibility on promotions of black leaders. Suddenly, Juneteenth is a recognized holiday. Uh, there's been a rapid rise of diversity and inclusion webinars and so on. All of you know and all of you have seen you know, what, what's, what the rapid rise uh, has unfolded. But I say all that to say that I've just seen a lot of talk and not so much action. However, there are a few companies that I have that caught my attention that I have seen start to get a little bit more granular um, in what they look like they want to commit to and what they feel like they're in a position to address. You'll see on the, on the screen here, a few of those companies in particular, but two that really stand out to me are Verizon and Levi's. And when I think about Verizon and Levi's, I, I, I appreciate the perceived risk that they took um, in really zeroing in on some of the specific issues that are important to dismantling structural racism. If I look at Levi's in particular, uh, and I look at you know, some of the, the work that Chip Berg, their CEO is doing over there, what draws me to what Chip is doing is the acknowledgement of his influence. I encourage you separately to, to uh, do a little bit of homework on Chip Berg and Levi's and, and what he's doing as far as bringing other CEOs along uh, on the journey and kind of rallying behind some issues such as gun control and that kind of thing. 
But what also stands out to me about what Chip is doing is his vulnerability. Um, long before the issues of today, Chip was vocal about gun control, about voter suppression, and so on. But now one of the things that I see that he's doing is he paused to make distinct linkages to structural racism. So he and others have taken that perceived risk, as I mentioned, and rallied behind specific issues and also acknowledged what they don't know, uh, but then also committed to actually moving toward doing something through their platform. So I could go on <laughs> for hours about this, but I will pause and turn it over to Marcus. Uh, Marcus, really curious to hear from you. What have you been seeing that's not in the headlines? What are you seeing that's really happening in the communities, whether it be through partnerships that you have with corporations and other community leaders? But what is what is it that we're not seeing? Well, first, uh, Renee, I, I, I gotta tell you, uh... Like I could sit here and listen to you for hours. <laughs> uh, and, I, and I love uh, how you kind of set up the framework of this and this conversation. So thank you and thanks to Sarah for uh, inviting me to come on to, to, to talk about such an important topic, such a heavy topic um, and something that, you know, I'm sure many folks are, 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 are frustrated and in, in that we're still having the same conversation, it seems that this country has been having since its founding um, in many corners. Um, but thank you. Uh, and also thank you for the opportunity to talk about, you know, how corporations can move to action. Uh, as one of the things I do, uh, you know, you named a lot of jobs that I have. Uh, one of the things I do, I'm also the chair, uh, co-chair of our diversity, equity, inclusion work at Big Brothers Big Sisters nationally. And, and one of the things I was talking to people about what DEI means to me, and, and, and one of the things I said with diversity is how something looks and, uh, and inclusion is, is, it asks the question and equity is the action part of it. Like how do we act? Not just what we think, not what we intend, but how are the people that we are intending to help, how are they impacted through our actions and our behaviors? And I think if we're going to um, have any success in, in mitigating uh, or even ending racism, uh, corporations have to get involved and we have to see um, that they have authentic uh, skin in the game. Um, I, and to your point, and I know you, you were walking the line, you, you were very careful not to put out your opinion on this and you were stating a lot of the things that you're seeing and some of the facts. And uh, I'm gonna take some executive privilege here as I'm speaking to, to, to give you my thoughts on this. Uh, and as a leader um, in, in different communities, I think it's important that we as leaders um, put ourselves out there to your point and, and the CEO Levi be vulnerable in these moments. And so I'd like to start with a um, you know quote um, from someone and, and many of you know the serenity prayer, God grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, courage to change the things I can and the wisdom to know the difference. But I like what uh, Dr. Angela Davis did. She took it a step further and said, I'm no longer accepting the things I cannot change. I'm changing the things I can no longer accept. And so as corporations, as, as we're dealing with this, I think this goes for corporations. And, and I'm gonna talk a lot to white people today as well, um, because it is my understanding and my belief that you know black people, people of color can't end racism. Um, racism, if, if we're going to have any success in any racism, it is going to come from our white brothers and sisters, uh, particularly in this country that we call these United States. And so as we look at what the MLB has been doing, we look at the, the really amazing stance that the NBA has taken, even the NHL, you know, who would have thought the NHL? <laughs> um, and so when you, look, when you look at these major sports team, and we know sports has a major influence on policy and on people and, and, and on movements and culture. Um, it, is, it, is, it is really awesome, in my opinion, to be a black man. In my lifetime, I've never been as proud and as optimistic to be black in this country um, with what we're seeing that's happening on a macro level, right? And to your point, we do understand that racism uh, and, 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 and its infinite impact is an individual decision and an individual behavior that is, is culminates in a collective. Um, but when we start to talk about how do we dismantle structural racism from a corporate perspective, and I know we're gonna talk about solutions later on, but I think it's important that as we're setting this table for folks to understand my perspective is that um, you can't remain silent. 
right? If you're if you're silent on this issue, then you, uh, in my opinion, are complicit in allowing racism to continue to flourish. And and not to be too quotish uh, today, but Martin Luther King said, "There comes a time when silence is betrayal. Our lives begin to end the day we become silent about things that matter. In the end, we will remember not the words of our enemies, but the silence of our friends." And so, as corporations are uh, uh, are putting themselves up as allies in this fight, it is important that all of them are not just speaking, but speaking loudly. Now we do understand that not everyone, uh, and, and I heard some a little bit, and I hate to say this, but I did hear a little sentence in your voice when you said like some of the ways that certain corporations are promoting themselves as it relates to racism. And there's, in, in my opinion, an authenticity that we have to really be focused on as we're doing this. Um, but the minimum is, at least start to speak on it, right? And we and and, and this is a journey. Um, this is not going to be. I call it progress over perfection, right? We are going to all be learning during this journey. And so I I applaud those corporations who jumped out there for whatever the reason is, right? I applaud you and your leaders who took a risk because we know that there is risk when people when you start to involve something as sensitive, as complex as deeply rooted in our country as racism. And then you start to have terms like white supremacy, right, white fragility, you know, ending race, uh, uh, becoming anti-racist. All of those new terms for certain people comes with some risk to your brand and to the sale of your services and products. And so we get that. And I think there's a win-win on the other side for us. And I'm sure we're gonna talk about that later, but thank you again for allowing me to speak with you for a few minutes today. Yes, no problem. Thank you for that, Marcus. And I think you and I can keep going right into it before we start hearing from, from others. But a few things that I do want to pick out that you that you said um, is about allies, you know, and it, this is something that, you know, we do need our white brothers and sisters to address and, and really put some action behind dismantling these structures. Um, and I, I heard someone say something recently that was, we need you to shift from allies to accomplices. Um, and that really stuck with me. We need you to get your hands dirty and you know walk alongside of us and really do some things. And yes, you did hear a little cynicism in my voice. I will be honest and, and say, <laughs> um, not to neglect or negate you know any of the risks that corporations have taken. But I am one too that is like, okay, this is great. It looks good, but let's see what's next. You know, when we've started to see a lot of the statements and you know a lot of the bold moves die down and quiet down a little bit. So because we haven't been here before, um, part of me does, you know, want to see what are you going to do next? You know, what, what, now that you've kind of made the statements, it's out there, you can't stop now. It's very easy and comfortable to stop now, but, but you can't stop now. So I hope I'm wrong <laughs> and I will work, you know, with folks to, to ensure that I am wrong, that the work doesn't stop. But again, we can keep going. I don't want to keep going. I want to hear from the folks on the call first want to ask a few uh, couple uh, poll questions here. We wanna know who we're speaking with and what are some of the things that are currently happening. So I ask that if you are with us on the line, you'll see on your screen uh, a question that we'd like for you to respond to uh, using the functions in the GoToWebinar. So first question is, has your company made commitments toward racial justice? So simple yes or no question. If your company has made a statement or a declaration or some sort of commitment, whether it be internal or external toward racial justice, please select yes or no. And while, while we're waiting for folks to answer that, just want to quickly remind you that if you have questions as Marcus and I are speaking, please do enter them in the Q&A function and we'll be able to address some of those at the end. And then if you have anything you'd like to share that you're seeing happening that's different, that you're actively participating you know, in with yourself, that's different, you can add those into the Q&A function too. We'll be sure to highlight some of those. All right, how are we doing on our results? Has your company made commitments toward racial justice? Ninety-two percent says yes. Excellent. So we have ninety-two percent of our participants say yes. Their company has made. Eight percent has says has said no. 
Okay, so second question, specific to the 92% that have said yes, what are, what are they doing? Are there any actions? Do you feel like there's been movement made toward those commitments? So to, to some of the observations that Marcus and I shared, have you started to see any movement internal or external toward making good on those commitments? And then again, if you have anything you'd like to share about what that looks like in particular, feel free to put that into the Q&A function. I feel like there should be a drum roll. <laughs> <laughs> the big reveal. Maybe that's something they should add to, like they let you clap. They go to webinar. <laughs> <laughs> they should. All of these virtual platforms and functions Pretty soon they'll be able to run themselves. Save those ideas. You may be able to, like, listen, that's the money right there you're talking about. <laughs> no, technology is not my thing. No. <laughs> All right, so what do our results look like? 81% said yes. Excellent. That is very heartening. I am excited to see that 81% say yes, there is some movement, and about 20% say no. So I think as we transition into the meat of our conversation, um, hopefully, you know, some of the things that Marcus and I will speak about on what actually can be done, hopefully a lot of you, those, the 81% that said yes, movement is happening. Hopefully this isn't new. Hopefully some of the recommendations and solutions are not new. Um, and then for those who, who haven't started yet, we hope that this gives you some, some seeds for thought, some seeds to consider um, as you do start to make some, some solid movement toward uh, towards your commitments. So let's transition, Marcus. Let's start talking about what can actually be done. One of the things that I wanted to start with you about is around this, the notion of trust. So the notion of trust in the community, the notion of trust in relationships, uh, the notion of, you mentioned earlier about, you know, Black folks can't dismantle racism on their own. Um, and so to me, that says we need the holders of the power those who have been in power within these systems to start to do it. But there is a distrust, you know, kind of a legacy of distrust, because again, this is not new and we're here, you know, how many decades, how many centuries later. So what would your advice or suggestion be to corporations who are looking to dive in and get their hands dirty within communities to really build trust, you know, amongst community organizations and leaders and that kind of thing toward actually doing something? Well, thank you, Renee, and, and and I'd like for us to go a little bit back and forth on this because I think this is a really deep question. Like the whole meeting can be taken up by that one question, right? And you and I had some great conversations earlier a couple weeks ago about this. Uh, but one of the things I wanted to comment on first, though, was that I love the word accomplices, but there's a friend of mine, uh, Tori weiss Surden, who's the uh, founder of the Youth Mentor in Action Network. I think she's out in uh, San Francisco or Oakland. And uh, she was doing a training with us and she talked about instead of being an ally, being a co-conspirator. And what I loved about the word co-conspirator, it just seemed so insidious. It just seems so like, <laughs> you know, <laughs> like, like yeah. something is happening that people don't want to happen. But her thing was that co-conspirators, uh, when you're a co-conspirator in something, you're being strategic, you're planful, right? So it's not something that you just fall into. You are making an active decision to do something that may not always have a positive impact on you, right? I like it. You believe so much in this cause, right? You're willing to put yourself into it, even if it harms you in some way because you believe it's the right thing to do, right? Uh, and so, as we, and that leads into as we start to talk about trust, um, you know, you know, I, we always talk about. You know, uh, like my grandma would say, like you, you know, you 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 don't you can't really know that you love something if you're not close to it, right? And we when we talk about that, we're talking about being proximal, proximity to stuff. And so, as corporations are looking at from a high level, a macro level, how do they, particularly if you have a a a, a cross country organization, a company or a multinational company, like how are you getting close to those folks that you're you're saying that you now all of a sudden you care about, right? Because we do know, like if we're gonna just be real for a second, like these corporations have known about these issues and challenges for some time, 
right? Mm-hmm. We've known that um, black people, like, you know, one of the things corporations are really good at is looking at metrics and outcomes, right? Mm-hmm. So they've known, and, and then and then some, we know there's been, you know, some forces <laughs> that have tried not to measure certain things so they don't have to look in the mirror and see that we know we're doing horrible and we've always done horrible when it comes to promoting people of color, particularly black folks, putting them in the C-suite, so we, uh, uh, those who are deserving, giving them C-suite opportunities, giving them board uh, seats on your corporation. Mm-hmm. Now you see a lot of corporations say, okay, we're gonna make sure, you know, we have at least one black person on our board, right? You see a number right. of corporations doing that. It's like, oh, that's awesome, right? And? But, but <laughs> what's precipitating that, right? right? And let's be real about what's precipitating it. Because in order for us to build trust in our communities, uh, and I won't go and talk about what this country must do because we can have a whole separate conversation and panel discussion on that. But from a corporation perspective, we, we got to think of first, how do we recognize, how do we reconcile, and how do we restore, right? Mm-hmm. Recognize, reconcile, restore, right? And one of the things that this country is not unique in, in is its history with slavery. But one of the things that I think it is pretty unique in is it's lack of acknowledging the harm that this has done to a group of people, right? Mm-hmm. And so when you do that and you try to just brush it over and keep moving, then you're going to continue to have challenges that at some point, yeah, it's affecting you know a certain group of folks, but at some point your house is going to be on fire. Right now you're mm-hmm. not worried about the house on fire; it's on a whole nother street. But right. you understand that that gas that is pumped into the house is connected. All of our pipes are connected to that same. Um, mm. gas. And so if you let those houses keep burning, your house is going to explode at some point. And mm-hmm. so, and, and we have to, like, we have to be that serious about how do we, the corporations help solve this issue. They have to take this problem on as if it's their own. And it really is. We mm-hmm. talk about white supremacy. And I got a question once someone asked me, um, well, does white supremacy hurt white folks? I said, absolutely. It hurts white yes. folks. Right. Because at the end of the day, I, you know, I used to play professional basketball. And one of the things I always saw from every level, elementary school, high school, basketball, college basketball, professional, every time we played a team that wasn't good, that was really beneath us, we always played to that level. We always, saw, we never played our best game against the worst. Hmm. And so I, that analogy I use when I'm, I'm doing this thing on white supremacy, because if you're white, and white supreme, and you get things just because not everything, because I'm not saying white people don't work hard, just as hard as, uh, as right. anyone else. But overall, if you continue to get things not because you earn them, but because of the color of your skin, at some point it does not allow you to be your best self, mm. right? And so, mm-hmm. in some ways, we are all being harmed by white supremacy by not having things be equitable based on what your characteristics are, what your values are, your competencies, your skill sets, everything that makes you who you are outside of your skin color. Mm -hmm. At the end of the day, our corporations have to take the approach that we are dealing with humans, not races. We are dealing with humans. This is about humanity. When you look, not to bring the Bible in this, I'm trying to stay away from religion and politics in this conversation. (laughs) But I have to say this, you know, in, in the Bible, race is never mentioned. Right, mm-hmm. never mentioned. Mm-hmm. Right, yet and still we 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 have a country built off of on the on the back of the dollar. We say in God we trust, right? Which tells me that you know we still in this country believe in in in, in our beliefs and our beliefs. At least my belief as a Christian tells me that God does not care about your race. Mm-hmm. And I, we should take that example when we talk about corporations. Yet and still, and not to contradict myself we do understand that because the the contextual part of this is that this country has always cared about race and so that we have to fix that right corporations, in order for them to build trust and going back to the proximal part you've got to understand what this community is dealing with before you think you're going to come in and just tell us okay you're just going to woo us with oh we'll get with one one of you on our board we put two of you in our C-suite, you know, like you, you yeah. got to understand what we're talking about. We're talking about compounded poverty. We're talking about um, living in a country where certain groups, their wealth has continually been taken away from them. And so when you're bringing young folks to the table and you're trying, you're looking at your pipeline as a corporation and you're looking at our communities from a place of strength now, 
right? Versus looking at us as a problem, as something that we have to keep giving to charity to try to fix. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And you start with that, take a different mentality as a corporation and say, I look at you as, as from, a, from a strength based perspective, from an asset based perspective, and I know that it is in both of our best interests that I do what I'm supposed to do, that I invest and engage with your community so that we both can continue to move forward, right? Mm -hmm. Understand that there, there's no blame here. Like we can't go back and fix what right. has happened, right? We right. can't, but if we don't at least recognize it, <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. We definitely can't fix it. That's just like, we can get to a solution. I'm just gonna solve the wrong problem. We right. can't It's gonna come this, up again, right? right? We're never going to solve this issue trying to solve something that does not is not the causation of this. And so uh, I, I implore that corporations do a number of things. One, um, think about um, uh, your pipeline. Like, where are you going to get your people from, right? Mm -hmm. right? If you're really serious about um, engaging people, and when we talk about people of color, I'm not just talking about Black folks either. We also got to, I want to recognize that we're also talking about intersectionality, right. right? So mm -hmm. we have so many people who fit in so many boxes. And in this country, we, we've grown so lazy that we want to generalize folks and put them in a box and say, okay, the millennials, they're lazy, yeah. they didn't do that, right? The baby boomers, they're selfish. They're like, no, 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 no. Like we, first and foremost, we have to get rid of the boxes, right? right? The music industry has, has, has a, a, a corner the market on this. Like <laughs> we only have AM channels, so you can listen to something and you could hear, um, R and B music, and you can hear pop music all on the same channel. And then we went and segregated our, our right. music. Right now we got FM. Now you got urban stations and all that stuff. And so it's it, it segregates us in a way that is harmful. I'm not saying it wasn't good for business, but it segregates right. us in a way. And we have to stop doing that. We have to also pay attention to our language, right? Sticking mm -hmm. with the music industry, right? When you talk about when an artist does their 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 they come out with these singles. And a lot of times the record companies have what they call the master. What I didn't know is any copies of the masters are called slaves. I right? did not know that either. You know that slave copy, right? And so as we, we start to think about a lot of corporations who are now beginning to look at the Aunt Jemimas and the Uncle Ben's and changing that language, looking at statues and, and, and all of these things that have carried the flag for racism and for white supremacy, as corporations, we will not be successful at building trust in communities if we're not educating ourselves on that stuff. And when I say that, mm -hmm. I say educating ourselves. So it is not right. up to Mrs. Allen to educate you on what this thing is about, because right. like we all can pick up you know, our computer and go into Google and go into TED Talks and do all of this stuff. So mm -hmm. let's not be lazy as corporations and think that someone's going to come in and do the work. Well, yes, you can hire a consultant. I think Pixera would be a great company to go out and hire to help you <laughs> and help you and figure out where to start, right? And how to hold yourself accountable. But at the end of the day, they're consulting. you right. got to do the work, right? And that work shows up to folks in the community, right? And one of the things I always say to folks, listen, like when you are about your business and you are about Black folks, then Black folks show up for you. Right. Mm -hmm. and, and we are smart enough to see what you're doing for just to sell your product or for your shareholder mm -hmm. and what you're doing because you legitimately <laughs> see value mm -hmm. in me and you see value in our community. Mm -hmm. and that's a whole different approach that you rarely see these days. Right. And I think we, we, we're starting the process to get there, but we have a long way to get there. Whew, you said a word or two or three there. I am scribbling down notes. So many things that I can pull out um, and come back to. Renee, Thank you. Say, I'm, I'm going to get in trouble today. I'm telling you, I feel so comfortable with you. I'm gonna <laughs> today, don't blame you it know, on me. <laughs> at the end of the day, it's worth it. So let hey, bring it. Let's do it. <laughs> um, a couple of the things that you said that really kind of struck a chord was to recognize reconcile and restore. And I feel like that can be applied to so many different things. Yes, when we talk about trust, but even when we talk about white supremacy, recognizing what it is, how does it show up for you? You know, one of the, Deirdre mentioned earlier that we have um, courage over comfort conversations internally and we're 
talking about what is white supremacy and what that means. And part of where we're going now on that journey is understanding how have we and how have our white colleagues been complicit and not even know? How have we been benefiting? How have they been benefiting from it and not even realizing? So recognizing within yourself, within your circle, within your family, within your network, whatever, how that shows up and then reconciling with it. That's hard work internally. That's a very personal journey, very individual work, but that's hard. But that's part of what needs to happen alongside of recognizing, reconciling, and restoring within the community, right? So before you can go out and work with others and help others and you know partner with others and co-conspire and that kind of thing, you have to know who you are and who's showing up to do these things because there are some deep-seated things there too that you might be bringing to the table, to the conversation. But that's a whole nother thing we could talk about. <laughs> One of the other things um, that struck a chord was language matters. That's something that we do speak about a lot internally at Pixar Global is nomenclature matters, language matters, very intentional about our choice of words because again, that is deeply seated and it manifests in our actions and in different ways and our beliefs and our perspectives and our views and that kind of thing. So just wanna highlight that for, for friends on the call. As a transition into- can I, can go ahead. I that just one second before you transition yeah, yeah. like the language part because I, I know I breeze over it really quickly but it is so important I, and I'll give you one example um so you know I wanted us to at Big Brothers Big Sisters um to really focus on um uh, seven years ago I became a CEO about six years ago I I, I knew that we needed to get better at understanding that we were going to have kids who were going to come to us who were questioning Right. And so we started this whole thing around LGBTQ, like doing training. We, we shut down our offices six years ago uh, for two days, just mm -hmm. focusing in on how do we make, how do we build safe and brave space um, for our LGBTQ community and, and their allies. And so one of the things we spent a half a day just on language. And when I tell you that it was eye opening for me. Right. Mm. And I'm thinking that I'm woke and I'm just like, I, I love everybody. I did work on the Native American reservations. I go to Israel and I'm working with some of the Palestinians over there. Like I'm and Jewish people and everybody. Like I love everybody. But I learned something about myself going through that two day training that being raised down south and being raised in a homophobic environment mm -hmm. that I had allowed certain things to attach themselves to me that I was not aware of. And so I had to do the hard work of saying, okay, I gotta study this thing and mm -hmm. I'm not gonna get it perfect. I remember one day at the office, there was something happened, the fire alarm went off. We didn't know what was happening in our building. We all had to evacuate. And three or four of my staff were walking down the hallway. I said, listen, and I, you know, as the lead, I'm like, I'm, I'm going down with the ship. I'm gonna be the last one out of here. So I'm trying to get everybody out of the office. And I said, ladies, be safe, have a good night. And, and later on, I got a comment from one of the staff who said, well, Marcus called me a lady and they were non-binary, oh, right? Mm -hmm. And before <laughs> I went through the training, I would have been like, come on, man, this is, uh, you know, I'm trying, to, I'm trying to save folks. I'm trying to make sure everybody's safe and all of that right. stuff. But now I understand that it is so important that you see me, right. that you recognize me for who I am and what I want to be seen as. Mm -hmm. Right. And so when you are talking, when you take that conversation, you, you come over to people of color, particularly black folks. And someone asked me once, they said, well, what is it that black folks want? Mm -hmm. And I said, um, so that's a tricky question because I'm only one person out of right. millions of black folks. <laughs> mm -hmm. I see. But I, I think I could tell you one thing that we all as black people should be able to agree with. And they said, what is that? I said, we just want to be treated just like white folks. That's it. Like, like that's it. At, just at, that at simple. Point, like if you can treat me like a white person, right? Then we good, right? Mm -hmm. Anything other than that, I don't want to be treated better. I don't want to be treated worse. I want to be treated the same. And that's how mm -hmm. I can look at it. Like, and, and so when you think about language, think yeah. about that that person wants to how that person wants to be seen and viewed. So anyway, I know you want to transition, but I had to get that out. 
No, please, we could keep on that thread, but I do want to come back to something that you said and kind of transition to um, in some of the investment piece of it. So you talked about compounded poverty. Um, you kind of talked a little bit, I was thought you were going to go toward capitalism and how closely connected to racism that is. I was hoping you would, but <laughs> that's okay. I can do it. One, <laughs> one of the things that we are seeing, um, and I've been, you know, kind of anecdotally, so not from headlines and not from, you know, some of our partners reporting, but from conversations that I'm having with peers and colleagues and that kind of thing. One of the things that I'm seeing is the surge um, in desire to invest in Black-owned businesses and invest in communities. So really tackling the economic piece of it, which is all necessary, which is all critical, um, which is all definitely needed. Can you talk a little bit about what that actually looks like and how does that speak to structural racism? So say, how does that look like? Do you mean like what our current circumstances look like or what like we what like it look like? What do we like it? What should it look like in order for it to really get at dismantling some of the structures? What right. do folks need to keep in mind? What do we need to know? What should it be? Right. So I I I think first and foremost, we gotta set, you know, proper expectations, right? We gotta level set and understand mm -hmm. that for so long, uh black folks have been held out of of this whole conversation about business right and those who many of those who are in business i i think you can talk to at least i've talked to so many different business owners black business owners and when they tell me the things that they struggle with right and mm -hmm. it's totally different than my good white friends who have businesses and i get it um mm -hmm. but i i think just like we are we, we we want our corporations to understand the type of people they hire from our community looking at them from an asset-based model you have to look mm -hmm. at these black businesses the same way. And it's not um, that we're asking for handouts. What we're asking for is that we have ideas, mm -hmm. products and services that we want to be in control of because mm -hmm. we know that we have a different way of distributing, of, of, of promoting, of marketing, of, or, of showing up that can benefit this economy. Mm -hmm. And we also understand that in order for us to take on some of our own challenges and our own problems in our community, that we have to have capital. And mm -hmm. we've been shut out of the capital markets for too long in so many varying ways. Like, you know, we can go through a list of the redlining, the the the, the predatory lending that banks do, the um, how credit scores, how you get credit scores and, and, and you be affected by your name and where you live and your zip code and insurance being based on your zip code and all of those things. Mm -hmm. When you don't understand how that impacts the individual, then you won't understand how the individual have hurdles when it comes to opening, uh, starting, opening and sustaining a black business. Mm -hmm. Right. And the many obstacles that these business owners go through just to have a business. Now, we are, I'm not even going to go into if it's profitable or not, um, mm -hmm. but just to have a business. I say to uh, my black constituents all the time, listen, if you're 18 and over, you should have at least two businesses. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I share, I know I shared a stat with you a while ago and I sent you some information today, Renee, I'm sorry. I, I saw your email late, but um, there okay. was a, a study done by the uh, Philadelphia Center City District uh, organization around um, businesses uh, of the businesses, Blacks in Philadelphia, we own about 1.9% of all businesses in Philadelphia, right? Philadelphia is a majority minority city, meaning we have more Black people in Philadelphia than we have any other race, right? But we only own 1.9% of the businesses. We have an African American Chamber of Commerce um, that pales in comparison to the Philadelphia Chamber of Commerce that has a, a budget probably 20 or 30 times that of the Black of the African American Chamber of Commerce. And so those challenges continue to persist. And so if 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 we're really going to support black businesses, we got to go deep with them. Mm -hmm. And we have to understand that we can't, it's not just about capital, but capital is a major hurdle for us. But yeah. it has to be some sort of, of mentorship that happens with this, like real mentorship, real role modeling, real, uh, and then also building out um, uh, uh, failure spaces, meaning that mm. like I, 
I, I am an entrepreneur. I'm a serial entrepreneur. I, I, I started, I was an entrepreneur starting at the age of 12, right? I was cutting hair. Um, and I, mm-hmm. and I started cutting all the guys on the basketball team here, the football team charging $2. And that was the way I was making money. And then in college, I had different businesses. And now I, I, I do different businesses. And I remember I was, a. Uh, <laughs> when I was married and, and, and I uh, had failed at a business. And I remember my ex-wife saying to me, he said, Marcus, well, you know, you're not good at this business thing. Uh, and I said, well, <laughs> say, well that's like the, the seventh business that, that, that you failed at. And I said, baby, I said, baby, understand something. I said, I just read this book by Robert Kiyosaki called Rich Dad, Poor Dad. And in the book, mm-hmm. Robert said, um, and Robert's one of the richest men in the world, right? Robert said, that the average millionaire fails at 13 businesses. Mm-hmm. I said, don't stop me because I'm halfway there, <laughs> right? <laughs> and so, I, and if we take that same thinking and apply it to black business, understanding that most businesses fail anyway, yeah. but there are some gems there that yeah. really water it, right? Uh, I read yeah. something that, uh, uh, you know, if you're trying to save a flower, you don't address the flower, you address the environment in which the flower grows, mm-hmm. right? So mm-hmm. like with black business, it ain't about the black business. It's about the environment that the black business is trying to thrive in, mm-hmm. right? So if we are going to help black businesses thrive, we have to look at the conditions that continue to plague the black businesses much differently, more impactful than it does with other businesses. Mm-hmm. Excellent. Yes. I, yes. I'm just going to leave it at that. Yes to everything you just said. I am mindful of our time. We have about 10 minutes left. We do have some questions that were coming in. So folks, if you have more questions that you'd like uh, either myself or Marcus address, please do put that in the Q&A function. Um, as before I go into questions, I want to ask you directly, Marcus, what are point blank, if you had the ear of any CEO, of any leader, of a corporation, what is it that right now you would recommend that they do toward dismantling structural racism um, from small all the way up to moonshot, you know, big, bold idea? What are your recommendations? Well, given our time constraints, I'll give you three. All right. One, um, which is very easy, like I would say invest like hell in HBCUs, historically black colleges and universities. They are struggling right now. There was a reason they were started. Those colleges and, 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 uh, and, and universities were started because at that time, it was not legal for black folks to get a, 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 an education. And so right now, I, I, I'm a product of HBCU. I can tell you my con- like confidence is so important. And if you're black in this country, and I don't care if you got a Harvard education, Princeton, my daughter graduated from Penn. If you leave those institutions and don't have a sense of who you are and the value and power you bring, you are not going to be successful. So if mm-hmm. we're going to uplift the black community, particularly the the educated, the academically inclined black community, we have to invest in our HBCUs, right? Mm -hmm. Uh, Secondly, stop just looking at the numbers, right? Uh, Mm. Definitely look at the numbers. We need to look at like, what are you diverse? Are Are you headed towards diversity? Like, what is your journey? What are your policies and all of those things? But also take out and think about like, how are you showing up to your black folks in your organization, right? Mm-hmm. Are you having, and understand something, there's always two conversations that that happens. White people talking to black folks and then black and folks talking to black. Talking to black. <laughs> right, right? So mm-hmm. there, there, there is still, uh, and we know this as black folks, that there is a penalty for really sharing what, how you really feel, right? Mm-hmm. There is a penalty when you're working for a corporation, and I talk to many of my good friends who are in, like I got friends who head up big corporations who are black, and as a like, Marcus, I can't even say that. Like it, there's no way that I can say that. And so if you're leading these corporations, you should be, you should not feel good, if not be ashamed that you have a segment of your employees who who always come to work and never show who they really are, mm-hmm. right? Who feel that. They're just here for a nine to five, right? And they and they're only giving you a fraction of who they truly are, right? So I think corporations mm-hmm. you have to start to dig in and just know. Don't even don't even guess. I'm telling you now, you don't even have to guess. You got mm-hmm. black people in the corporation who are not talking, guaranteed, right? Thirdly, um, and this is the moonshot, right? Um, I know that there are corporations, huge corporations out there who have stock 
stock, uh, I think the, the term is inactive stock or unused stock that they have on their books, right? And many of them have had these stocks on their books for years, some decades. And there's, there's an idea that we're floating around now about what if we, both corporations and members of the black community, whatever the sectors of the black community were to create a fund where these corporations would say, hey, we're gonna donate and we make it into some sort of nonprofit, doesn't have to be a 501c3, but we donate 2,000, each corporation makes a pledge to donate 2,000 shares of their stock, whatever the, 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 the pricing is on it, what have you. And that stock that you're currently not using goes into that corporation. You get a you get a uh, some sort of tax uh, deduction for that stock, right? But that stock is going to be used by that entity to create capital, mm -hmm. and those, mm. that capital is going to go towards building infrastructure in our communities. Whether we're talking education, whether we're talking um, uh, workforce development, whether we're talking uh, safety, public safety, you name it, uh, mental health, all of that stuff, and so. Uh, me and a group are, are, are and, and I got a couple guys who are Six Sigma guys who've done, who've been working in, 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 in Fortune 500 companies for maybe 10, 20, 30 years. And we're trying to, to hone in on this idea and this concept. And we think this could be something that corporations, if you're really serious, can get involved in that can help to bring um, almost a trillion dollars mm. into um, the black community. And so, um, those are just three. I have, you know, I went through this with Renee. I have a list of about 18. Um, but We're going to capture those from you too. <laughs> <laughs> We're going to share them out with real, real things um, yeah. that should be evaluated by corporations and, and by think tanks and do tanks uh, around. And, and there are some people who are doing some great work. Like I'm not the only one. I, I don't have a, you know, a patent on this, but there are some people who are doing this work that have some great plans that corporations should start to delve into. So it sounds like either a part two conversation that we need to have or some sort of publication, we'll get it out there because um, I think it is important for folks to, to have more of the tangible things that could be done. So mindful of time, before I turn it over to Deirdre, I do want to acknowledge some of the questions that came through in the chat. So Marcus, if you could really quickly speak to, and I'm gonna read it directly as I see it here. Might you talk about the space where anti-racism work overlaps with other justice equality movements, especially re related to the private sector? For instance, your discussion about representation and not being enough is something that is talked a lot about in the LGBTQ community. Uh, we don't just wanna see corporate floats at pride parades, that kind of thing. So it really seems to me that all of us in marginalized communities, non-white, female, queer, et cetera, can, should, ought to work better together to drive equality and equity. How might we do that better as it relates directly to the engagement you're discussing today in collaboration with the corporate world? So how might we kind of leverage that intersectionality piece? Well, I, I think first and foremost, we gotta make sure that we don't compete, right? This is not the poverty Olympics, right? Where everybody's saying, <laughs> well, we've, been, we've been harmed, we've been harmed, we, and before you know it, there's so much division and, and people are going in a million different directions trying to serve these different labels that we, you know, that are man-made. Um, I, I, I think we have to fight for each other, right? Like, just because I'm a black man doesn't mean that I don't care about LGBTQ rights. It doesn't mean that I don't care about the fact that women get paid 78 cents on the dollar compared to a man, right? Mm -hmm. And so we have to continue to be just as vigilant when it's directly affecting us as even if it doesn't affect us, because mm -hmm. we have to be concerned with you know, racism, anti-Semitism, um, uh, homophobic, all of that stuff, it, it, there's no weight to it, right? We, I, I'm not here to say that the Black issue is the most important issue facing our right. country, right? But it is an issue that we have neglected for decades, mm -hmm. hundreds of years. And so we have to deal with that. But we can, we, we're, we're smart. We can do all of them at the same time. And, and anti-racism, mm -hmm overlaps with all the issues that, that your, your person with the question had. Excellent. I'm going to squeeze in one last question. If you could just quickly speak to what do you see as the benefits for companies and nonprofits uh, as far as it relates to diversity um, in leadership, diversity, board service, that kind of thing. What is the benefit? What's the value of that? Well, I, that's easy. Simply put, um, uh, there is a collective genius when you bring different people together. Right. When you have just one type of group, 
then you are only seeing one very small sliver of a solution. But when you bring a multifaceted rainbow together, like those perspectives are, that's where you begin to see the genius of human beings, right? Mm -hmm. like, uh, thinking that you're just going to deal with people who look like you, think like you, and you're just going to be just uber successful from that. You, you will get some success. There are companies that have done it, right? Mm -hmm. But imagine what we as a country could have done and can do when we make sure we create an open table for all people to sit at that table and be and equally share their voices. Excellent. What a positive note to end on. Thank you so much for that, Marcus. You and I could go on for hours and for days. Um, thank you for the candid conversation and for your time. Always enjoy speaking with you. Deirdre, I will turn it back over to you to take us home. I don't know how I could possibly follow that. I could listen to this conversation all day. Thank you so much, Marcus and Renee. That was just uh, terrific and thought provoking and uh, challenging to all of us. So um, just want to close up really quickly here um, with just uh, a cl closing thought for all of you. You know, I, I mentioned at the start of this that we at Pixar Global have taken some significant, um, some bold and some relatively quick decisions and actions over the past few months. But as I said, we all know it's not enough. And because we've committed to having tough and uncomfortable conversations with our partners and friends, I wanna remind you all that whatever steps you and your organizations have already taken to be anti-racist and to dismantle structural racism, it's not enough. We're here today because we know that when business takes bold action, it can change the world. So just imagine if just 10 of the world's largest corporations were to fundamentally change the way they do business, their board makeup, their supply chains, their banking relationships, their community relationships, their recruitment and hiring and mentoring and compensation practices, the language they use, if they remove the penalties for speaking out and being authentic, the way they educate themselves and the way they engage their employees in social problem solving and ensuring equity. Just think of the impact and influence that example would have on other businesses. That's if 10 did it. What if 50? What if 100? And Marcus said it's frustrating that we're still having this conversation, that we're still fighting this battle. I genuinely believe we're at a unique moment in the world when that can change. So I would just leave you with this challenge. Think big and boldly, and as Marcus advised, build in failure spaces in that big and bold thought. This isn't a time to be timid. Move faster, move a lot faster. Um, again, to paraphrase Marcus, even if you believe your house is not on fire, it's about to be. <laughs> Do more, slow and incremental change will not dismantle structural racism. Whatever you are already planning, double down, triple down, quadruple down on it now and not tomorrow. And we're here to support you with any of the above. So thanks for joining us today for this thought provoking conversation. We look forward to hearing from you, to working with you and to making meaningful change together.